Ladies and gentlemen, during most of its history, humanity hardly experienced economic growth in the modern sense of the word. Documentary evidence shows that the average person in the 17th century did not enjoy a better quality of life than an average person at the Roman Empire. It was 2,000 years of stagnation. Modern economic growth of continuously increasing human lifetime and improving living standards came only in the past 200 years with the Industrial Revolution. Now, what is the symbol of the Industrial Revolution? The steam engine. Later, in the 20th century, the symbol of modernity became the first car on the street, the first electric light in the city, the first tractor on the fields. Changes in energy technology represent milestones in human history. But all of this came at a price. Think about all that black smoke belching from the chimneys in the industrial era of paintings and pictures. The black is particulate emissions, which is a serious health hazard even today. But what is even more serious is what you don't see in the pictures. A colorless gas, carbon dioxide. The once emitted, carbon dioxide stays in the air for centuries, and there's a clear scientific evidence that its accumulation in the atmosphere is the main driver of climate change. There is also an increasingly stark evidence that from extreme weather events becoming more frequent to rising sea levels, climate change impacts are potentially disruptive. The scientific consensus is that while even the current 1.5 degrees warming over the pre-industrial level has negative implications, humanity should definitely stay under a 1.5 degrees limit. Now, given that it is the cumulative emissions over the course of history that matters, that leads to some challenging mathematics. In order to have an even money chance for stabilizing the climate at 1.5 degrees, humanity cannot emit more than 500 billion tons of carbon dioxide in the future. But in the modeling analysis, the future started in the January 1st, 2020. And in less than two years, more than 50 billion out of the 500 has already been emitted. In fact, the coronavirus epidemic, with all its unprecedented lockdowns and restrictions, succeeded in cutting global carbon dioxide emissions by around 6%. They have rebounded strongly since then, and might well exceed the 2019 historical peak. So the task is nothing less than comprehensively rewiring the energy system, which is the largest and most complex machinery in the world economy. And this machine is growing. In the rich Western world, there is little correlation between human development and energy use. Going around Western Europe and different regions of North America, regions and communities of similar lifetime, similar health and similar welfare can have energy consumption varying by a factor of three, depending on efficiency and lifestyle choices. This is the part of the world where additional energy use is for the circulation pump of the swimming pool. But when we go around the poor and developing and middle-income countries, where increasing energy use is equivalent to 12-year-old girls going to school instead of collecting firewood, or introducing electricity to one of the 60,000 hospitals in Africa which don't yet have it, there's a very strong relationship in that part of the world between human development and energy use. Refrigerators, pipe water, and washing machines are among the foundations of modern lifestyle, and more than 3 billion people in the world don't have either. Energy use mirrors the astonishing inequality among humans. So how this large and growing machine can be rebuilt while the climate clock is ticking? Well, the, my job and the job of my team at the Shell Scenario team is not to predict the future. That's, of course, impossible. But we can reflect on possibilities, and we can help decision makers and society navigate the unavoidable uncertainties. There is a lively debate among researchers, scientists, modelers, who designed various pathways and roadmaps. It seems quite clear that the energy transition is not going to be uniform. It will unfold with different speeds, and it will take different shapes depending on societal choices. But there is an emerging consensus in three main pillars. First, putting steel into the ground and rapidly increasing investment in already mature low-carbon technologies. 
The second is accelerating innovation and developing new low carbon technologies. And the third is changing lifestyle and, and behavior. Now, the most important already existing technology is energy efficiency, retrofitting buildings and improving industrial machinery. The potential of that is huge. Here in Hungary, an average building consumes more energy for winter heating than a similar building in Finland, despite the much colder winters over there. So this efficiency potential, sadly, is often neglected. For new low-carbon energy supply, so far, technological progress has been highly uneven. Instead of a clean energy revolution, it would be more precise to talk about a clean electricity revolution. If the symbol of the industrial revolution is the steam engine, the symbol of the energy transition is the wind turbine and the solar panel, both of which generates electricity. Now, electricity today is only 20% of the final consumption of energy. The rest is oil products used in cars and trucks, gas heating buildings, or coal used in steel plants. Consequently, the energy transition is not going to unfold in a copy-paste fashion, replacing every fossil fuel with the equivalent low-carbon fuel. It will involve a systemic change. It will necessitate the ramping up the production of low-carbon electricity and bringing that clean electricity into the applications which today use fossil fuels, like electric cars replacing conventional cars or heat pumps replacing gas boilers in buildings. Now, this will necessitate a massive expansion of the electricity system. Families putting solar panels on their rooftop, by all means, is a good thing. But 100 million family homes with solar panels in Europe or in North America would represent around 10 to 20 percent of the low-carbon electricity that these societies will likely to use. Given the energy needs of a modern industrial society, the heavy gear have to be brought in. Large ground-based solar projects, thousands and thousands of gigantic wind turbines, other renewable sources like geothermal power, and also nuclear power in societies which decide to use it. And last but not least, an expansion of the transmission system to take the electricity where it is needed. Now, ramping up renewable electricity production and electrifying energy use will take the energy transition far, but not all the way. There are more than 10 billion tons of carbon dioxide emissions from the heavy industry and also from long-distance heavy transport where clean energy solutions have just started to make the first inroads. And these are important applications. As people around the developing world leave their villages and move to growing megacities, urbanization currently is running at a speed of a Budapest every week. Cities are being built from concrete, bricks, steel, glass, and plastics, precisely the energy-intensive, hard-to-decarbonize industrial commodities. Now, even in those industries, there is no need for breakthroughs in fundamental physics. The science is understood. But there is a need to accelerate industrial innovation, and there is a need to radically shorten the time between the laboratory and large-scale application. Now, innovation and investment are crucial tasks for governments and the industry. But the energy transition will also need a contribution from consumers. Now, nobody will have to go back to the Middle Ages. Nobody has to give up on taking a hot shower or charging a mobile phone. But everybody can, can reflect on lifestyle and consumption choices. When somebody buys something, factories ramp up to operation, ships and trucks start to move in the delicate interconnected web, which is the global economy. Reasonable and comfortable lifestyle choices can significantly ease the, the difficulty of the transition journey. Moreover, industry is already working on developing clean energy solutions, but very often those clean energy solutions depend on consumer choices. Building electric car chargers, chargers along the highway and powering them with wind, wind turbines doesn't help too much unless consumers buy electric cars 
and go to the station with an electric car. A question is often asked, what an individual can do? Well, climate change is a global problem, and it will, it will require unprecedented global cooperation. But what every individual has a role to play, three roles to be more precise, think about it as wearing three hats. The first hat is the hat of a citizen, participant in a political system. Governments pay attention to what citizens think. Now, old school, top-down government policy remains absolutely essential. And all around the world, governments will have to implement energy policies which were conventionally deemed to be politically impossible. So make it possible. The second hat of an individual is that of an investor. The financial system channels money from individuals into clean energy investment, and it will have, have to channel much more, thousands of billions of dollars more. In addition, investors can support the transition by encouraging companies to move further and faster as shareholders. Last but not least, the third hat of an individual is that of a consumer who can use his or her spending power to create market for clean energy innovation. So ladies and gentlemen, climate change is the defining challenge of the century. Governments, industry, and consumers all have a role and all have a responsibility. It can be tackled, but only by working together. Thank you very much.